So here's where we're at. Uh, James chapter 2, go ahead and pick up with me in James chapter 2. You go to the end of your Bible, you hang a left, and uh, you'll find it. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not uh, super complicated. Um, and so uh, James was written by Jesus' half-brother. Poor guy. It's like he probably could never catch a break growing up. It's like you're always wrong. You can't argue. You can't like tell on him uh, anything that he did wrong. Uh, but he's Jesus' half-brother. He's the blue-collar scholar of the New Testament. He's the guy who just tell me how this works, you know, cut out all the technical mumbo jumbo, tell me how this works. And his main concern, being a very practical blue collar guy, is showcasing how real faith shows up in real life. I want to I show you that this is not just some abstract principle. This is not just something that you, you hear and sit and are around on Sundays when you're with a bunch of other Christian people or whatever. This is actually something that affects your marriage. This is actually something that affects the way that you relate to your roommate. This is something that actually affects the way. Uh, the tone of voice that you have with your kids, and, and this, this is actually something that affects the way that you relate to, to failure and success and all those things. And uh, when it comes to our faith, there are, um, there are certain truths that are essential. Uh, and uh, there's two t- kind of two types of truth. There's tough truth, and there's tender truth. Now, let me distinguish. So tender truth are the truths that leave you feeling just super welcomed. It's like, come close. It's like, come give me like a big hug. It's like those types of truths. And, and it's going to be like, God has a purpose for your life. God pursues you even when you run from him. God has a great plan. He's very patient with you. It's like, okay, I, I'm in. It, those are welcoming truths. And we love those, right? But then there's what's called tough truths. Tough truths are, um, it, it leaves you feeling warned. And they're no less important. So a tough truth would be, hey, if you give yourself to lies, if you give yourself to laziness, if you give yourself to lust, it's going to end you. It's not going to go well for you. And what James does is he is very big on these tough truths. And uh, he, he's giving us these tough truths not to beat us up, but to build us up. Because how many of us, we all understand, we can't know ourselves by ourselves. We all have blind spots. We need people to show us those inconsistencies in our life with grace and truth. And that's what James is doing right here. And uh, no exception today, he's going to do the same thing. He's going he's to warn us. He's going to give us a tough truth to warn us about something that we all struggle with. And here it is, partiality. So partiality is judging a book by its cover. Partiality is prejudging someone before you actually know someone. Uh, it's, the, it's actually the opposite of love. Uh, pr- uh, partiality is what happens when you, when you label. Uh, and uh, I, I do want to clarify, it's not the same thing as preferences. We all have preferences, right? Uh, to be a person is to have a preference. And I, I, I think that if we were just kind of go through some of the everyday stuff of life, like sports, okay? Some of you have a favorite sport or a favorite sports team. I was talking with Eleanor this week about the professional sport team that plays football in the Carolinas. And does anybody know what the name of that team is? The Carolina Panthers. She thinks it's the Carolina Beavers. Okay? So if you tell her otherwise, I'm not changing her mind. She's like, the Carolina Beavers play on Sunday, all right? So we all have preferences when it comes to sports. We also, we have preferences when it comes to the weather. Who's all about the fall right now? Anybody else? All right? So it's a great time to be at the beach, and here's why. Because you can get all the seasons in one day. You wake up, and it's winter. Uh, by noon, it's summer, and by the afternoon or the evening, give me all those fall layers in my pumpkin spice because I'm feeling all the fall feels over here, and it's just this cycle. And so, I mean, you just kind of pick what time of the day you go out, and that's, that's the, the weather that you like. Uh, we also have, you know, food preferences. Some are very particular about what you will eat. Others are just on the seafood diet. It's like, I see food, I will eat it, and there it is. Now, I'm going to enjoy that very much. Others, uh, and this is, we usually marry each other. There's the, the different internal thermostats. You guys know what I'm talking about? So one, one is like, uh, I, I need all the layers. I need all the blankets. Give those to me right now. Uh, you're probably, actually, you're probably cold right now. <laughs> I'm talking about this. You're just like, I was wondering when you were actually going to acknowledge that. And uh, you're cold right now. And then the other is like, keep it at a cool 68, the fan going at all times. That's my vibe, all right? And so we've got different internal thermostats. Uh, we also, like, we wake up differently. Um, some, some people wake up like a pogo stick, just ready to go, ready to have a good time. Others are just like, the Lord is on the throne. I'll see you at noon. All right. And <laughs> we're, we, these are preferences, by the way, I do want to clarify partiality 
on the other hand, is stronger than preference. Partiality is what happens when your preferences become your prejudices, and it comes out in your relationships with God and people. It's when you take your preferences and you turn them into prejudices, and it comes out with God and people. And so the the tough truth that James is bringing to us today comes to us in the form of two warnings. Number one, don't show partiality towards certain people, and don't show partiality towards certain parts of the Bible. So we do this in both, on both, both levels. We show it towards certain people. We will prejudge. We will label because of someone's age, someone's ancestry, or even someone's accent or how they look. And to live and relate this way, I just want to point out, it's the opposite of love. Just think about it for a minute. Think about those times when you felt left out. Think about those times when you feel like you're on the outside looking in, and it's a consequence of somebody else's partiality. We've all had those moments. And when we put ourselves um, in, in these shoes it opens up our hearts a lot quicker to see, I don't want to do that to someone else because I know how that feels, but we do it. But then we also, we show partiality towards certain parts of the Bible. What we like to do is we are Jesus's followers, not editors, and we need to understand that. But we like to edit the Bible. We like to make it say things that it never said, and it's, it's heartbreaking. I don't say this lightly. It's heartbreaking, but some of us, we could jump in like a church van, and we could go on a tour of the Grand Strand, and I could point to certain churches who have chosen to side with the culture instead of side with the Scripture on certain issues. And it's hard. It's really hard to see. Um, And what James is doing today is he's going to pick up and he's going to show us the solution to partiality. And he's going to say, hey, we all deal with it, so let's deal with it, right? So chapter 2, verse 1, my brothers. So he's talking to family. The way that you talk to family is different. You can say some things. You can be a little more honest. You can, uh, you can relate on a, on a closer level. He's talking to the family of God. Now, what does it mean to be a member of the family of God? Because, by the way, not everybody is a son or a daughter of God. Everybody is a, is a creation of God. Everybody is loved by God. But to become a son or a daughter of God is to receive Jesus as your rescuer and king by faith alone, through grace alone, and Christ alone. And so uh, we need to understand he's talking to the family right here. And what does a good family do? Well, what does it mean to be a part of the family of God? It means that you know God as Father and the church is family, right? And uh, what does a good family do? Well, those who have in the family take care of those who have not. A great example of this would be the parent-child relationship, the, the dependence that a child has on a parent. Well, there's going to be those, those aspects socially, economically, many times in the church. And that's what James is saying. He's like, hey, let those who have take care of those who have not and don't discriminate. Show no partiality. As you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So we're going to come back to verse 1 here in a few moments, but I want to show you that this is the first warning that James gives. Don't show partiality toward certain people. You're like, that's simple. It's like it's just it's right there in the text. And we're coming to this idea of partiality. And again, we're thinking favoritism. This is bias. This is labeling people. This is unfairly judging people. And it, one of my preaching professors in seminary mentioned how this shows up in six ways in the church. First of all, it shows up with affluence. We will look at some, how affluent is someone with their wealth. Um, and that's where James is about to go in these next couple of verses. Uh, we'll also show partiality because of someone's appearance, the way that they dress, the shoes that they wear, the way that their hair looks, the color of their skin. And then there's accent. So uh, I, I very much, I still have a southern accent. I grew up in the mountains of western North Carolina, and apparently if you have a British accent, people think that you're more intelligent. So I thought that I might start talking like this and just wonder whether or not people might think that I'm more intelligent than I am. <laughs> Bad run, I promise I'll never do that again. <laughs> but, well, it, there, we do, I, I just showed you one of the ways that we do show partiality. is like we'll think that because if someone talks a certain way or looks a certain way or has a certain thing, that they are superior. We also do it with age, all right? So just get ready, okay? I'm going to pick on both sides of the aisle. Okay, you know, uh, the senior saints will just like look down and be like, kids these days, man, just don't want to work. You know, just think that just everything should be handed to them, all right? I remember when I was a kid, I was, man, we didn't even have HVAC. We didn't even, I was sitting out there on the front porch with grandpa and it was just, it's like, whatever. Okay, great. That's awesome. Um, we're probably not as tough as you are. I'll say it. But then there's, 
And they're like, what are we going to do with those millennials or those, those Gen Zers? Like, it's like they're from another planet. And so, all right, I'm done. I'm done. Uh, but then there's the younger crowd. They're like, man, those boomers are so out of touch. Could somebody just teach them how to use their phone and hold it the right way whenever they're taking a picture? <laughs> so, seriously, I've been wanting to have this conversation for a really long time. Can we just talk about it? And uh, this is real. And then there's ancestry as well. We discriminate based off ancestry. Ancestry, it's like, in so many places, it's like, who's your family? Who are you related to? Blood is thicker than truth in so many places and spaces in society. Who do you know? Who are you related with? And then there's achievement. It's like vocation. What do you do? Your education. How many degrees? And then I said there were six. I'm going to throw a seventh one in there. Alliteration. Some of us have the gift to make everything start with the same letter. And that doesn't make us any more better. It just makes us a little bit more Baptist. So at ease, don't worry about that. It's, it's, it, it just helps remember some things, all right? And so like, like any good preacher, James tells a story to illustrate actual footage, what's happening in the church, how partiality plays out. Take a look at verse 2. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Verse 4. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So what James is doing right here is he's illustrating the sin of partiality by highlighting where people would sit in church. And this actually is a brilliant way to talk about it because seating is a sign of status. You start thinking about it all through history. How have we known who the kings and the queens are? Well, they're the ones that are going to sit on the throne, right? And apparently this was an issue as far back as the first century in churches. The church was importing this this secular way of thinking, the way that the world related in terms of status and seating into these church gatherings. And James said there would be these wealthy people who would show up to a church assembly, and this would often be in someone's home, and they would get the best seats, and they would get treated like royalty And all the peasants could take the back seat is basically what was going on. And uh, I want to point out that this has actually been an issue for church people for a really long time. Uh, And apparently the history of seating in church has seen some terrible and embarrassing moments. I don't know if you know this or not, but up until the Protestant Reformation around the 1500s and the 1600s, people didn't sit like we sit in church today. Uh, In fact, uh, in Eastern cultures, they're totally fine even still sitting on the floor. And that's what they did. But during the Protestant Reformation, something called pew boxes were introduced. So here's how you can think about this. Think reserved seating for church. Like you've got to go on Ticketmaster. You've got to go on StubHub in order to make sure that you have a good seat at church. And these seats, they were not open to anyone. They were actually these closed off uh, like boxes with with these uh, cushioned seats. Some had fireplaces. Get out of here. And there was no chance that you were getting in one of these if you weren't close with the family, if you didn't have some semblance of status to your name. There's actually disputes between children over who is going to inherit the pew box whenever their, their parents kick the bucket. And so it was a sign of status. Who got the best seats at church? And here's a question that we're asking. Why though? How, why would the church ever, ever dare think, think like that? Um, and here's the, here's the question I want to ask you is, what makes that wrong? What is it inside of us that says that's not the way that it's supposed to be? That's not the way that God relates. Because if we just pay close attention, the kings and queens of culture today still have pew boxes and thrones. They just look different. So I'll use um, this example. If you've been anywhere on social media in the past couple of weeks, you know that apparently Travis Kelsey from the Kansas City Chiefs now has a thing going with Taylor Swift, all right? And I don't know how that's going. I, you know, wish them the best, all right? I'll just leave it there. But when, when Taylor Swift shows up to Arrowhead Stadium, she's not sitting in the nosebleed section. She's in the VIP box seat sitting with Travis's mom. Like the, the best seats in the house, 
The kings and queens still sit on thrones or concerts. It's like you can tell who's really got the moolah by who's on the front rows or who's in the green rooms or in the airplanes. You know, that cursed middle seat. Nobody wants that. I think that's where we got the idea of purgatory from. A temporary season of punishment, but it's not going to last forever. That middle row in the airplane. You know what I'm talking about. Or like today, what we've done is we've actually minimized the seating at the movies. Have you guys seen this? So that we could turn it into lazy boys, so that we could go in there and and have a viewing experience like a king or a queen. And James's point right here is simple. The only king of the church is Jesus. And the only throne in the church is occupied by Jesus. And so everyone else, regardless of bling, beauty, or bank account, is equally and at once sinful, forgivable, and valuable in God's eyes. And he's saying, church, you act this way. And this is very different than what the world teaches us, because in the world, how does the world relate to seats? You get what you pay for, right? That's what this whole sit like kings and queens, if you've got the means, uh, thing is about. But in the church, we get what Jesus paid for. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, every person, every place, that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but would have eternal life. That would have a great seat at the table. In the kingdom of God, there's no such thing as a bad seat. And so what is being said right here is that Jesus purchased and provided admission into the kingdom for anyone, anywhere, at any time, who will believe in Him by faith. And so, this is supposed to affect the way that we show up to church, apparently. When anyone enters the church, they've entered a totally new society where the first are last and the last are first. And yes, the Bible actually does talk about a day when Jesus will assign seats. And there's going to be a lot of surprises whenever He does. Take a look. This should be on the screen. Matthew chapter 19, 28 through 30. If you're taking notes, maybe you could jot this down. This is this reference. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man, that's a reference to himself, will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So for the, for the whole, doesn't the Bible say you're never supposed to judge crowd? No. This is a plot twist right here. The Bible doesn't say we're never supposed to judge. It says when we're supposed to judge and how we're supposed to judge. And it's ultimately under the judgment of Jesus, not the, under the judgment of Jeremy or you or whatever it is that you think is right. There is, a, there is a point when we actually do judge, but it's just judgment that's rooted in the justice of God. And apparently, I don't understand everything that's going to happen right here. I'm reading it with you. But apparently, there's a day coming when that's going to happen. In verse 29, and we're going to be seated with royalty. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands, all the things that the world is after, give me, give me, give me, give me. He says, you give that up for my name's sake, you, will, you won't regret it. You will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But, watch out, many who are first will be last and the last first. So we wonder where James gets all this. Well, this is where he gets it. He gets it from his, his, his older big brother. Jesus tells us that the seats of honor are not reserved for the people who have the most stuff. It's for the people who have the deepest belief in Jesus. And it's for the people... And what, what, what happens is we show that with how we live. We're willing to give up certain things that the world is not willing to give up because we have gained something that the world is yet to gain. Jesus, our truest treasure. And honor will be shown to all whose real faith showed up in real life. That's what he's saying. And so we just ask, like, what is, what is this supposed to do? What's the, what, what difference does this make? Well, it's supposed to transform the way that we see and relate to one another according to the word, not according to the world. And so the context right here in James focuses on uh, the rich and the poor, and that's real. Oftentimes, the, the poor will actually snub the rich and, and, and thinking that it was, it was corruption or it was entitlement, or everything was handed, or you know, a number of different things. And often the rich will snub the poor and think, oh, well, you just, you know, if, if only you were as dedicated as I was. And it's just, it's not that simple. 
And, and we've got to cast off those categories and see that there's a lot more at play than just the rich and the poor dynamic with partiality. This no less applies to other social dynamics. Um, this shows up in, in, in church. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's some, some of you, you're more expressive in worship when we're singing. All right. Others, you're, you're just a little more subdued. All right. Subdued. You're like, you're right here. You're still playing paper, rock, scissors. All right. Just wondering if, if, if you could go and maybe, maybe carry the TV a little bit. You're just right here. And then maybe you'll go widescreen some, someday. Others of you, you're, you're just still doing the, the chicken flap right here. You're, you're kind of into it. You're kind of into it. Others of you, you're just like Lion King. Touchdown, Jesus. You are all in. You are all out. And what happens, I'm going to name it, sometimes we'll look at each other and be like, what's wrong with them? Does you love Jesus? If so, you'd be more expressive. And others are just like, it's just so irreverent. Just like, well, you just, you're just trying to put on a show over here. You know what happens. And so sometimes this will happen between working moms and stay-at-home moms. And there will be this silent judgment that happens between the two, assuming the worst. Other times it will be, oh, you send your kids to public school. Wow. You, you, you're going to outsource their discipleship like that or what? Or, or, the, or the, oh, you, you homeschool. You, you clearly don't care about their social skills. So, and so there's, this, there's this silent judgment that's happening right here. Uh, or maybe it's towards someone who's married, single, divorced, widowed. Or it happens between liberals and conservatives. Uh, the liberals, they only care about progress and justice. Uh, and conservatives are like, well, you only care about preservation and godliness. And so there's this silent judgment that's happening, and there's partiality that happens. And here in Myrtle Beach, by the way, let me just say this, this happens between the North and the South, all right? It's still not over, all right? Northerners meet Southerners, and I, I'm convinced that one of two things is going to happen over the next decade. I'm no prophet, but let me just say this. I think the next major revival is going to break out of Myrtle Beach, or the next civil war is going to break out of Myrtle <laughs> Beach. And at Coastway Church, we are pushing and pressing for it to be revival, and we want to invite you to participate in that movement with us. Beneath our partiality are what James refers to in verse 4 as evil thoughts. And, and what he's doing is he's getting into the mind behind partiality. And there's two things that are, that are behind it, beneath it. Selfishness and superiority. Selfishness. Here's, here's how it shows up in partiality. I'm going to be good to this person because they can do something for me. That's called using people. That's called manipulating people. So someone's beautiful, you're like, well, I could date them, I could sleep with them, I could marry them. Or they're powerful, maybe they'll give me a reference. Maybe they'll hire me. Maybe they'll promote me. Maybe they'll give me the grade that I want. And it's all like, it's about me. And that's where the partiality is coming from. But then there's superiority. You will reject or neglect this person because they can't do anything for you. And so again, what are we doing? We're treating people like pawns instead of people created in the image of God who are equally sinful, forgivable, and valuable. And this is what James means when he says, you have become judges with evil thoughts. And so what is the solution to partiality? Well, James actually let off with this. With this. And uh, he, told it, he told us what the solution is really in a general way in verse 1. And I want to I want to invite you just to look a little bit closer at verse 1. I'm going to have you underline a phrase if you're taking notes. Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the, underline this, Lord of glory. So the solution to partiality is God's greater glory. And basically, a way to think about this was, would be you see Jesus' throne above your own. And how do you get to that place? It will strip you of your partiality. Well, you've got to understand, what is God's glory? That's not just a fancy church word. It's very practical. The Bible is very practical. God's glory is God's goodness and greatness gone public for all to see. It's God's goodness and greatness gone public for all to see. So let me talk about goodness for a moment. We were singing about it um, as Alan was leading us earlier. Just what a meaningful moment that is to be reminded of God's goodness. But you know that you have experienced God's goodness when you, when you are left saying this, yes. So you have that delicious meal, and you're like, yes. You have that need that was met. You go, yes. You receive forgiveness, or you, you show forgiveness, and you go, yes. 
There's physical intimacy between a husband and a wife. And you go, yes. God's goodness is experienced when, whenever you are left saying, life is not about me, but God takes really good care of me. But God's greatness is seen when you go, wow. So that sunset just leaves you in awe. That deep blue ocean, it, it, it leaves you in awe. Did anybody see that harvest moon last night? How, how amazing. That is the glory of God. That is the greatness of God gone public for all to see. And it leaves us in awestruck wonder saying, wow, life is not about me and I'm low key okay with it. Because even in this moment, in my smallness, I still feel seen. Where is God's glory? That's what is God's glory. Where is God's glory? Well, it's seen most clearly and centrally in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the goodness is in the the incarnation, Jesus leaves His glory to step into our story, to meet us in our need. And then through the crucifixion, He meets our greatest need, where He pays the penalty for our sin. And we look at that and we go, yes. Yes, that is what this is all about. Life is not about me, but God really is good to me. But then we see His greatness Whenever we look at the resurrection and He's making all things new. And we see Him ascending to glory, now seated at the, on the throne of creation where He reigns and rules over all. And we can't look at Him and not feel small, but we can't look at Him and not go, wow! That's goodness, that's greatness, that's glory, and it's the solution to our partiality. Take a look at verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom which He has promised to those who love Him. So the people who the world tends to reject are the people who God tends to select. That's what He's getting at right here. Uh, God doesn't care so much much how much money you have. He cares how much faith you have. And that's why he talks about being rich in faith. That's that's what God's heart is all about because the richness of our faith, not the richness of our finances, is what is going to determine the condition of our hearts and the trajectory of eternity. This is why uh, the Scriptures say in 1 Samuel 16, 7, God looks at the heart. I mean, you think about it. You don't have to look very far uh, to see this example. Like God chose David over strapping Saul and his handsome older brothers. And why did he do that? Well, because David was rich in faith. God chose Mary and Joseph, two teenage peasants from rural Nazareth that was about the size of this gathering as a town. He chose them to to bear and to raise and to nurture Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of glory. Why? Because they were rich in faith. And you think about on the opposite, a negative example of this, why did Judas betray Jesus? It's because he wanted to be rich by the world, but not rich in faith. And what did that do? That ended him. It didn't go well for him. And so God doesn't measure our faith by our finances, or or our, our, our worth by our finances, but more so by our faith. Rich or poor, you can have great faith. You can be rich in faith. And that's the hope that's held out to us. And that's why James says this, verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor man. So what he's saying is you're not treating people the way that you've been treated. It's like, that's, that's two-faced. And there's a, there's a way to be better. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name, that's the name of Jesus, by which you were called? So James is... I, I want to I give some clarity right here because sometimes, if you don't have context, the Bible can be confusing. And I want to give some clarity right here that James is not saying that the materially rich people are all bad. Uh, nowhere does the Bible teach that. Uh, he's all, but he's also not saying that materially poor people are automatically more godly than rich people. What James is talking about is something that Jesus and the rest of the Bible talked about. He's talking about this exploitive dynamic between a certain type of rich person and a certain type of poor person. And so Jesus, James, the whole, James, the whole Bible talks about this. So there are two types of poor people and there are two types of rich people that the Bible describes. And uh, basically what we tend to do is we have, for the most part, a low-resolution view of, of richness and poverty. 
But what the Bible does is it gives us a high definition view and how we can think fully with nuance, with love and impartiality. And I want to show this to you. So the first type, uh, uh, the first type of poor person is the godly poor. Historically and globally, this is most Christians. Uh, James is family. Mary and Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter. Mary was a teenage peasant. Uh, I mean, they just didn't come from a lot of means. They didn't have a lot of status or wealth. Uh, this was Jesus. You know, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to, to lay his head. But then there's the ungodly poor. This is what Proverbs talks about, the sluggard. Um, this, is, this is the person uh, who's a bad steward, um, who won't work. Uh, Jesus encountered this, uh, this type of, of, of poor person whenever he entered into a, a town in Luke 17, and he healed 10 lepers. They had nothing. Only one came back to give him credit. And so he was dealing with someone who um, was poor, but that didn't make them godly. There was only one who came back. And then there's the godly rich. I mean, just think about it. This was Job. Man, multi-millionaire. Abraham, multi-multi-millionaire uh, by today's standards. You think about Zacchaeus in Luke 19. He started as ungodly rich, but he ended as godly rich because of a personal encounter that he had with Jesus. You think about Lydia in Acts 16, uh, a, a wealthy, influential businesswoman who, who helped to start and largely fund the healthiest church in the New Testament, the church at Philippi. So there's godly rich. And, but then there's the ungodly rich. And so what James is talking about right here is he's talking about this interplay between one and four, between the godly poor and the ungodly rich. The ungodly rich, they're lawyering up, and they're exploiting the destitution of the poor in ways that is unfair. And James is saying, that's the person that you're going to treat better than the brother and sister who's rich in faith? It's like, you've got it twisted. And so James's message to these scattered believers facing lots of trials and temptations, showing partiality is simple. Stop looking down on other people and start looking up to Jesus. Stop looking down on other people and start looking up to Jesus. See His greater glory. Focus more on His throne than your own and go out and treat people the way that He treated you. That's what this is all about. But we see that James isn't finished. He doesn't just say don't show partiality to, sort, to certain people. He's got another clear warning for us that is actually beneath all this. He says don't show partiality towards certain parts of the Bible. I want to show this to you. Take a look at verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, that's a reference to the Bible, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the Bible assumes that you love yourself, by the way. And it says that's the reference point. You are doing well, but if you show partiality towards certain types of people, you are committing sin. So that word sin is actually an archery term. And it means to miss the mark, to miss the target, and to be disqualified. So what is your neighbor Greg across the street doing whenever he's unrepentant and, and, and won't follow Jesus? Well, on one hand, it's like, okay, you're, you're resisting and rebelling against God. You could think about it that way. Or it's like, Greg is missing the mark. He's missing the mark. And we, we, don't, we don't like it when people miss the mark. Actually, we pay millions and millions and millions of dollars to see people hit the mark. That's what sports are all about. Let me get this, this ball in that hoop. Let me, get this, let me get this pig across that chalk line. Let me get this, this ball across that net. And we go nuts when people hit the mark. That's what sports is all about. But we get really disappointed when people miss the mark. Have you ever seen those half-court or those half-court shots like at halftime or a break during the game when somebody will be brought out there and if they hit the shot, they're like, you're gonna win ten thousand dollars, you're gonna win a hundred thousand dollars. It's like you get one shot, and very rarely do people ever hit it. Well, imagine all of us, we get that one shot and we miss it and we blow it. There's no chance that we could ever redeem that. But then there's somebody who comes out of the stands named Jesus who sinks it, nothing but net, and he credits his shot to us by faith, and he gives us the wealth that results from his victory. And so that's the difference right here. But we've all missed the mark. We've all missed the shot. You, he says, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So transgression is another term for sin in the Bible, and it means to cross the line. It means that you are now on private property trespassing, and you could be justly punished. And verse 10 says, but for whoever keeps the whole law 
So this is the person who's very moral. This is the person who goes to church. This is the person who reads their Bibles, says their prayers, mostly polite to their neighbors, but fails in one point, has become guilty of all of it. So what he's saying right there is um, obedience in one area doesn't override disobedience in another area. So if we discipline Eleanor for not picking up her room, she's not going to no longer be in trouble because she says, yeah, but I brushed my teeth. Well, that's not the issue right now. It's, it's, it's you're changing the subject, and we tend to do this with God. And so verse 11, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So James is interacting with something that we all do. We pick and choose which parts of the Bible we will obey, and it goes like this. I've never committed adultery, or I've never murdered someone, so that means I'm good. Doesn't God like grade on a scale, and it's like, okay, Billy Graham and Mother Teresa, they get an A, Hitler gets an F, I gotta be a B minus, so I'm good, all right? <laughs> He's like, no, actually, it's pass or fail. It's pass or fail. There's no in between, and you failed. But what we say is, we'll, we'll say, well, I've not done these things, or I've not, I've not committed this sin. So, so what if I show a little partiality toward people? James's response, if you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have no less become a transgressor, that is, cross the line of the law. And so what he says right here is, okay, I'll play along. I'll play along. Let's say you didn't physically sleep with someone who's not your spouse. First off, very few can actually say that let alone how Jesus elevated the law to include lust as a form of adultery. In that case, none of us plead innocent. But let's say you are somehow innocent. If you show partiality, you are no less guilty in God's eyes because partiality might not come out in the form of physical murder, but it is very much mental and social murder at least. We got into this over the summer. If you weren't here, and when we walked through the Ten Commandments, that was a humdinger of a series. I mean, you need to go back and check out uh, this, this message on this very issue, Murder We Wrote, on Exodus 20.13. It's about you shall not murder, and it gets into this. And basically, it talks about Jesus comes in and he says, hey, if you, are, if you are angry with a person to the point that you take pleasure in seeing them suffer over what they did or them being different, that rises to the level of murder in your heart. Or he'll say, you're, you're committing social murder when you assume the worst and attack with words, you go after their reputation, you insult them, you gossip about them, you slander about them. He's saying, all right, anybody still off the hot seat? <laughs> this happens with the poor, but it also happens with any person or group that we don't like. And what James is saying right here is profound. If you decide you'll only take certain parts of the Bible seriously, then you'll end up showing partiality. And what he's saying is a low view of the Bible is going to result in a low view of and one of the most vivid examples that I've, I've heard of this is um, the third U.S. president, Thomas Jefferson, had a very odd relationship with God and a very odd relationship with the Bible. Some, actually, some can, uh, accuse him of being an atheist. He was a philosopher. But here's basically what Thomas Jefferson did. He took the Bible and he literally took a razor to the pages and cut out the parts that he didn't like. And then he turned the part, and, and those were the parts about miracles, the parts about the atonement, the parts about resurrection, the parts about Jesus being God. He said, that, that just messes with my modern enlightened sensibility, so I'm going to cut that out, and I'm going to make it into something that makes sense to me. And it became the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth by Thomas Jefferson. Low view of the Bible. And I thought, how did that affect Thomas Jefferson's view of people? It turns out that he owned 600 slaves more than any other U.S. president in history. A low view of the Bible means a low view of people. This is unthinkable. This is unbiblical. Praise God that chattel slavery has been abolished and that there have been voices in the wilderness who have cried out like William Wilberforce and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the church today crying out and saying that this is unspeakable. But here's what, if we're not careful, the same seeds of partiality that were growing inside the heart of Jefferson will grow inside of us today, and we've got to be on guard. And nowhere does it show up more than with people who we will and will not love. And I, I, what I'm trying to say with all this is that partiality is a failure to love. 
It's a selective love. It's like, I will only love the people who can pay me back. But love, by definition, is sacrificial. It's costly. It's a, it's, it's a costly commitment to another person's highest good. So look back one more time with me at verse 8. Do you see where he talks about the royal law? Well, what's that about? Well, it, it, he says that it's about loving your neighbor, rich or poor, northerner or southerner, black or white, young or old, married or single, able or disabled, as yourself. And this is called the royal law for a, for a few reasons. Number one, because it comes from royalty. The royal law is the law that proceeds from the throne of King Jesus. And Jesus modeled this in John 13. He gets down off his throne on his feet, and he washes the stinky feet of his disciples. And he says, I've set an example for you. As I've done for you, you go and you do for other people. And by the way, he did that for Judas too. So we are left completely without excuse. But it's also the royal law because it makes people feel like royalty. When you treat people the way you treat yourself, they're going to feel like royalty. It's also the royal law because it guides and governs all other laws. It is over and above all. It's like all those 613 laws in the Old Testament, all the Ten Commandments, you want to nail it? Love God and love people. I'm like, thank you. I'm simple. That helps me. Love God and love people. But James goes on, verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. And so James goes from the law of royalty to the law of liberty. What is he up to right here? Well, the law of liberty is something you freely choose because it's good and right. In other words, I don't have to be forced or coerced into loving people who are different because I've seen the way that Jesus loved me despite our irreconcilable differences. He's God, I'm not. He's rich, I'm poor. He's impartial, I'm partial. He's innocent, I'm guilty. And at the very moment when God could have justly judged me for all my poverty and partiality, He sent the Lord of glory to lay, aside his, to lay aside his glory, to live an impoverished and impartial life. And in doing so, he took the due punishment for my partiality onto himself at the cross. He was judged because of me. He was judged instead of me. And in that, I was shown great mercy. Knowing this, James says this, verse 13, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What will you do with God's mercy toward you? That's what James wants us to think about as we go through this whole teaching on partiality. What will you do with God's mercy toward you? Because here's the deal. Go back to that, how he started, the Lord of glory. You hold faith in him, you're going to see victory over partiality. So if I'm looking at the Lord of glory, then what's, what's going to happen is I can refuse that glory and I can... I can rest in my own glory. And what, that, what that's going to do is it's going to produce in you a very judgmental spirit. And you're going to be harder on other people than you are on yourself. You're going to nitpick things. You're going to be partial. And what he's saying is it's not going to go well for you in the end because Jesus is going to justly treat you the way that you unjustly treated other people. And eternity is going to be very hard. Or, here's the, the better alternative, is we can look at His glory and we can receive His mercy. And when we receive His mercy, we reflect His mercy. So we're a lot more gracious, we're a lot more patient, we're a lot more kind, we're a lot more understanding, we're a lot quicker to assume the best. And what happens is, even though we're deserving of judgment, mercy triumphs over judgment because we've received that mercy and God treats us as if Jesus had given us His record as he took ours. And so, uh, here's what I want to do. I, I just want to invite you, would you bow your heads and open your hearts? I want to invite our care team to come forward as, as we prepare to, to sing. And as I, I just want to invite us to respond to this word that we've heard today. And a few things that I just want to, I just want to ask you right in your seat, and then I want to pray for you. And if you you just need to talk to someone, if you need some encouragement, if you just have a prayer need, then you just come forward and just have one of our, our care team encourage you. But here's, here's what I want to ask you. Have you received this mercy by faith? See, if you've not received the mercy of God, you can't show the mercy of God. And the way we receive the mercy of God is by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. So maybe you've not done that, but you just say, that's what I'm ready to do. Would you admit 
that you've crossed the line, that you've fallen short, and that you're sinful, and that you need a Savior? And would you believe that Jesus did everything necessary to buy you back and bring you back through his sinless life, substitutionary death, and victorious resurrection? And would you confess him as your Lord? Would you say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life, take complete control, cleanse me of my partiality. I am yours. And maybe that's where you're at. Before you leave today, would you tell somebody? Would you stop by the tent? Would you let us pray with you, give you a Bible, talk to you about next steps? But for others of you, who do you need to reflect mercy to? Someone in your life has disappointed you. Someone in your life is very different than you. And if you're being honest, you've been way too hard on them. They've done the best that they could, or maybe they didn't. But God didn't treat us as our sins and our partiality deserved. Who do you need to show mercy to? I pray that we would do that. And let me pray for us right now. Father, thank you that you stepped out of glory to join our story and to pour out, pour out grace on us, pour out mercy on us. I pray that those who need to transfer trust from self to you, to admit, believe, and confess that you are their rescuer, that you are their king, that they would do that today. And I pray for the person who just needs to reflect your mercy to another person uh, who's different or disappointed them. I pray that you would give us the strength to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand to our feet. And if you would like prayer, you come down and our care team would love to minister to you. And for the rest of us, let's sing together.